بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another beautiful eve of Ramadan al-Kareem in which the nafahat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends upon us. May Allah make us of those who are fortunate in this month. These evenings we are strolling through history, reminding ourselves of those glorious moments that changed the shape of the Islam that we know today. Those victorious moments, those victorious beings that Allah sent into this world in this month of Ramadan that gave victory to Islam, Allah Akbar. Today we travel way back in time and we're going to go to a, a particular point in Ramadan which is the 25th of Ramadan. It's a Friday in the year 1260, um, common era if you will. And this is going to be in a place which is called Ain Jalut which is in modern day Palestine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease, ease all the affairs in Palestine. That place, Ain Jalut, was the place on the 25th of Ramadan all those years ago that many people may or may not know, even know about today. But it was that by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala passed Islam on to the generation that came after because of key events that took place at that time. That was the a uh, face off between the great armies of the Mongols that were the uh, uh, savage Eastern warriors that were coming to attack the Muslims on the other side and particularly the Mamluks. These were two battles, that were, were these two giants that were going to be fighting and these were going to shape the face of what we know as Islam today. But in order to understand what fully went on and how this came about, there needs to be some context. And the question first that should be said, who were the Mamluks? Those people who understand the Arabic language, Mamluk is, we could translate as a slave. Now, how can slaves ever get into unassuming power? If we look into uh, 1250, 12, around that time, uh, common era, we saw that the, it was the Ayyubids that were in power. The Ayyubid Caliphate was going to be one that uh, started with Ayyub al-Kurdi. And he was a person who was uh, in the courtyards of um, uh, the King Zenji. Zenki as, well as, as they would want to call him. He was the one who rose up in power and eventually his nephew, as we all know, the great commander in Islam, Salahuddin Ayyubi will assume this position of taking over the affairs of Egypt. And he is the one who is the great, the great liberator of Jerusalem. And he gave uh, Masjid Aqsa the freedom that he needed. Allahu Akbar. Rahmatullahi alayhi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill and ennoble his grave with nur for the khidmat that he did for this ummah. But it's in this time of this time when the, the ruler of the time would be Najmuddin Ayyub. And he was the one who was uh, in charge and this was the Ayyubid dynasty. Now he, on the many travels that he did and the many conquests that he had in his time, Najmuddin would be, whenever he went and he saw that there were people that were orphans in Central Asia, that area, that he would take the young boys that were uh, had no means to look after them and he would take them almost like military, uh, like slaves if you will. And they had nobody else and this was some sort of support. But it's not to make them into slaves. What he wanted was something more refined and more better. He wanted these slaves, these military slaves, we'll call them from now, because that's the name that was given to them, Mamluks. So these Mamluks were little boys. They were trained, they were taken into the courtyards, not into any orphanage, but into the actual palaces of Najmuddin. Here they were taught the finest, uh, uh, you know, bravery, fighting skills, the art of stratagem and uh, you know, mathematics and jurisprudence and language and all the sciences that they could possibly do to refine them, to make them into the formidable warriors that the Mughluks are going to be known. Now the last of all the Ayyubid uh, leaders, if you will, the leaders, was one by the name of Turan Shah. When he was assassinated and finally uh, toppled, then his wife, Shajarat al-Durr, 
she was the one who took the power and took this space of being the leader of this great Ayyubid, uh, almost like a failing dynasty at this stage now. There was nobody else, so the wife assumed the power. But Baghdad, not so far away. So this is in Egypt. Not so far away, Baghdad, which has always been the capital of the Islamic empire. They had issues with this woman leading in this on this side. So they raised objections. So she said, I'm going to, you know, renounce my position and I'm going to give it to somebody else. Mu'iz Aybak is going to be the one who takes his power. Now, in a short time, he passes over to his son, Mansur Ali, after he passes away a short time later. Now, Mansur Ali is going to be significant because it's at his time when he's ruler that things are going to take place. Now, let's just take a side step. There's going to be a man by the name of Hulagu. He's one of the leaders of the Mongolian army. And at that time, he is going to attack uh, uh, Baghdad. And when he ransacks Baghdad, the center of the Islamic civilization, and he's going to be taking them, and we'll come to that in a minute, that he takes it in such force, the next he has his eyes set upon Egypt, because they've conquered everything to the east. And now they have their eyes set on the west. The only thing standing in the middle of them is going to be this place called Egypt. So now he has his eyes set on uh, Damascus, Aleppo, and then he's going to go on to Egypt. And this is, the, this is what he wanted. So he took over Aleppo and Damascus with ease. And now he's coming over here. And people knew that this was going to be a very strong time to go against the army of the Mongols was something which nobody ever dreamed about. Everybody was submissive against the great power of the Mongols. We'll come up, come up on then who the Mongols really are. But at this point, what happens, everybody says that if we are attacked, this Mansur Ali, who's the, our leader, he's a young, like a teenager, if you will. He's in no position to be even laying up a fight or leading the armies of the Muslims against these invaders. So what they do, they said, they, they almost pressured him at this stage to even give up power. So Mansur Ali does. And Allahu Akbar, Allah, they plan and Allah plans. Allah is the best of planners, Allahu Akbar. Because the one who's going to come into place is going to be the one who they know as the name, the title that is given by Allah Akbar is Sayfuddin, the sword of the religion. And this is the one who they call Qutubuddin, uh, rather Muzaffar uh, Qutuz. The name is Muzaffar Qutuz. And Rahmatullahi alayhi, and what a warrior he was, Allahu Akbar. You're going to speak about him, Allahu Akbar. As soon as he comes into power, you're going to see seismic changes happening inside. Because he was a person who was taken at a very young age into this, this Najmuddin's uh, you know, armies. He was a Mamluk by, by his... his uh, he was actually a person who Halugu, the Mongols, had taken over his entire place. And they uh, ransacked and killed everybody in his family. And he was a little boy that was taken in by Najmuddin many, many years ago. When he was a little boy and he was in the training camps now of these uh, of the Najmuddin Ayyub, Rahmatullahi alayhi. At that time, on one of the nights, he went to sleep and he sees in a dream a saintly person, a man of extreme beauty. And he knew instantly that that was our beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At that time, the Prophet ﷺ tells this little boy, and he barely over the age of nine or ten, and he says to his little boy, he says, we are going to give you the keys of Egypt, and we're going to use you to uh, stop the forces of the Mongols. He, his eyes open with a gleam in his face and a bounce in his step. He goes to his teacher, the, the Imam of the Masjid, and he tells him the entire story that he saw in his dream. So immediately he says, he says, no way. Who did you see? It can't be. Are you crazy? You can't make bold statements like this. Nobody can stand against these Mongols. He says, it wasn't just anybody. It was my Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that told me. He says, if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it, then it will surely come to pass. This Qutuz, this, this great warrior who grows up to be in the armies, he takes on many, many battles and, he, and he's rising up against the ranks, in the ranks of the Muslim armies now. And he's, he's one of those, the Mamluks, that they're going to be start taking over. These Mamluks who were once slaves and now become formidable, brave warriors. Part of their training would be so intense that they would have a, a, 
is mentioned by Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi He says that they would have a, a target that was uh, 95 centimeters in size. 95 centimeters. And they had to train themselves in archery from a distance of uh, 75 meters away. That they had to hit this target. That's not the hard part. Because they didn't have machine guns. They had uh, arrows and archery, bows and arrows. Anybody who's done archery, they know that the hard part is, uh, you know, uh, recoiling and shooting and aiming. And one thing is getting the target from that distance, 75 meters away, a target which is only 95 centimeters in size. The hard part was that they had to prove to their commander that they could shoot three arrows in a minimum of 1.5 seconds. This is how amazing they were in archery. This is, they had to learn the strategies of war. They had to learn mathematics. They had to learn language. They had to learn fiqh, jurisprudence. This is what made all the Mamluks are really strong warriors. And it was against the first battle that they had. It was against the uh, King Louis, Louis, the, what do you want to call him? He was a Frank. And they had a battle and they won that day under the leadership of Qutuz. Now, Qutuz is going to be what, here. The Mamluks are first time going to be known for their being not little boys that were slaves, but now they're formidable men warriors. And this is Qutuz who's going to be taking these men from us, uh, feet to feet and they're going to be rising up amongst the ranks. But the problem is going against the Franks in those days was something, but going against the Mongols was something entirely different. The Mongols, if you want to travel back in history, that was founded by a man by the name of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan is going to be the leader who rose up from the east. His real name was Tenu, uh, Tenujin. So what he does, Temujin of one, his, that's the name, his real name, but everybody knew him as Genghis Khan. Now he was a person who raised an army and the, one of the key things that made him different to everyone else that wanted power in those days was before he actually went into an army to fight against an army, he would study them. He would study their customs. He would study their religion. And then he would use their customs and their uh, religious uh, you know, intricacies against them to wreak havoc. And that's what made him so powerful. So what he would do, he would send scouts inside and he'll study the religion. Now he's going to attack Baghdad at this point. This is only going to be like almost like uh, 1258 or 1257 around that time. So Baghdad, the center of the Islamic uh, government, and, the, and ru ruling it at that time was the final more, the remnants of the Abbasid Empire. Now what happens, they were so engrossed in their luxuries that even when people told them that there was an imminent uh, attack danger from these Mongols, they didn't really care. They said, nobody will attack us. And they were too busy enjoying themselves. In fact, Ibn Kathir, he makes mention that it was a night when the leader of the, of the Ayyubids, in, uh, rather the Abbasids inside Baghdad, was enjoying themselves with some uh, you know, some courtiers and there was, they were having, uh, you know, jokes and frivolities inside the palaces in the, in the huge palace, which was on a high place. And there was a young girl who was standing by the window, uh, the, on the balcony. And one of the leaders, Helugu, he was actually the leader. He shot an arrow that hit this little girl and she died instantly. And the issue over here, when they realized that this arrow had hit and this killed this girl, they opened this message that was inside. And in it, he wrote that when Allah, look at the, look at the audacity. He says, when Allah wants to exact his decree on a people, then uh, to destroy them who have forgotten their ways and, and intoxicated themselves on these uh, frivolities, then Allah takes away the minds of them very ones who he gave them brilliant minds to. That he's using their words and even don't be fooled by them mentioning the name of Allah or in the name of Allah, as we're going to see a bit later, that he was the one that they would be using their tactics against themselves. Like who calls the name of, as if they were Muslims, but they won't. They had studied these people. They had anticipated every move that they possibly could make against them. And then they attacked. Allahu Akbar.
Imam Zahabi rahmatullahi says that when they attacked, they pillaged through every scholar, every judge, qadi inside the areas, mosques and masajid and schools were destroyed. The books that were in the thousands in those days and the scholars that were there were killed. The books were uh, thrown inside the rivers till the river water had turned blue with the ink of those manuscripts that were there that would never ever be found ever again. Blood was flowing in the streets of Baghdad and this is the way they pillaged through that place. These Mongols were the ones that when they entered into a place left a trail of devastation and blood amongst their path and that is why nobody could ever step towards them. Allahu Akbar, Ibn Athir from the chroniclers and the historians of this, this Ummah. Ibn Athir says in, this, in, in his write-up of what happened in the Crusaders times, he says that SubhanAllah, one thing that we should understand, Ibn Athir was one that was amongst the time of the Crusades, even famed to write at this time when there was so much destruction going on. He just wanted people to know, on later generations to know what was taking place in them times. He says that just to know what kind of a scene it is at that time, he says there was one person from the Mongols, one Mongolian, who went into a place, which uh, a qom, which there was over a hundred people. And when he went into there, he absolutely killed every single one of them hundred people single-handedly. And there was not a single resistance against him. This is how submissive people had become against the Mongols. But this was then. But the one we're speaking about, Muzaffar Qutuz, Rahmatullahi alayhi, Allah inspired him with a different dream. That dream that he saw of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never ever forgot. In fact, when he was 90, uh, 12, rather 1258 or 59, almost a year before this battle is actually going to take place, that he was given the, assumed the leader of, he became the Sultan of this, this empire now in Egypt. And he knew that his time had come. His teacher, the Imam who he told the dream to, he would always tell the people, this lad is the one who Allah will grant victory to. And he's the one who's the only one who could take them out, the Mongols he was speaking about. This was uh, Qutuz. And now he's going to assume the power. So when he assumes his power, the first thing that he does, he knows that he has to rally his people. Now what's going to happen? He's going to be, if we look into that time, there's going to be two people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made like these heroes of this ummah. One is going to be Muzaffar Qutuz and another one is going to be by the name of Qutubuddin Babers. Then two individuals are going to be formidable warriors and key players inside this episode that we're speaking today of this Ain Jalud that's about to come, this battle. So what happened was, if we looked at Muzaffar um, uh, Qutuz, he was from the the Aibak uh, fraction of this um, this Mamluk dynasty. Whereas the other one that we speak, Baybars, is going to be Qutbuddin Baybars, is going to be from the ba Bahriya faction. And they were something, they were two te separate people of the same Mamluk dynasty. Although they didn't get on, they, did, they had their issues, they had their differences, and they just didn't like each other for whatever reason. And they just did their own thing and they, they were ruling on one side, they were ruling on the other side. But these Mamluks, now this is where the brilliance of this man called Qutuz comes about, Allahu Akbar. He knew the strategic unity was needed. And so he reached out to this person, Babers, and he says, we need to unite if we are to defend the West and defend Islam. That if we don't do something now and stand up against these Mongolians that are about to attack us, then we will be destroyed. And Babers, being the clever man he was, he agreed. Both of them unite. And at this time is now what happens. The Halugu is going to be suddenly takes a surprising retreat from Damascus. He doesn't retreat himself. He leaves Damascus. And historians later say that it was because of one reason that in the east, his great, his elder brother had just died. Now, so he had to leave. Now, what he's going to do is Qut Buga is going to be the general who's the most fiercest warrior in the Mongols is going to be placed inside. Although he's not Hulugu in, in, in rank and in experience, but he was a formidable warrior and a leader. So he's in charge now of this Damascus um, 
Mongol faction, if you will, this army. Now what happened, they said, we're just going to come now, we're going to take over Egypt. And on this side, Qutuz has in his heart, he says, the dream that I saw many years of my Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that this is how we, it is going to play out. He says, now is the time. We have to take advantage of Hulugu not being there. We're going to surprise them. But it just so happened that the Mongols had sent an envoy. Now what happened was whenever they attack a place, they would always send a message that, you know, in the eloquence that they say, they says, we are about to attack you. Safety is in you retreating and giving up everything. Whatever is ours will be yours. If not, then we will uh, attack and pillage. But the letter that they wrote that day, they said, in the name of Allah, the one who has, uh, who has raised the heavens above and flattened the earth for us, he is the one who has called on this day. If you surrender, then you will be saved. And if you don't, then you will find out what happens. And he, and he gives his letter. Now, this is something which every person dreaded. A letter from the Mongols meant absolute annihilation or submission to them. There was no third option. But this time, Muzaffar Qutuz Rahmatullahi he rose up and he assassinated there and then those envoys from the Mongols. And at that time, that was almost like a declaration of war against the Mongols, something that no one had ever done before. And Allahu Akbar, you saw the fear in the people and almost excitement. And now uh, Qutuz rallies all his armies, rallies all the Baybars armies all together. And he begins to make his historic khutbah in which he says the all princes of Muslimin, today I stand before you that we have enjoyed the, uh, from the wealth of the treasuries whilst you hate the invaders. I am about to go out to war. Those who step with me can join me along on this, on this, on this war, so we can protect the future of Islam. In the balance is the very existence of Islam, and so we have to stand firm and stand together. And if you choose to not stand with me, then go back to your homes. But know that Allah is ever watchful and the sins of all those innocent women and children that were slaughtered inside the streets of Baghdad is on the necks of those who leave. Everybody cried and everybody was absolutely rallied up and they wanted to join in this, 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 this standoff against the invading armies. Now what happens is a beautiful moment because Babers is going to be the one who starts this off. And these are masses of strategy. So what they did, they took, took small groups to the Mongol army, rather than waiting to come to them, what they did, they started provoking them along this on the paths. They would provoke them and then get a lay chase. They would, they're trying to basically get them to a place called, which is called Ain Jalut. Now Ain Jalut is a place which is in Palestine, modern day Palestine. And it was the actual place where in history, it tells us where David and Goliath had this big battle in history. So this is the place where they're going to be coming. The stage is set. You know, Kutbuga uh, with his Mongolian armies are going to chase the little uh, Babers uh, factions all to this place. And they've arrived only to find that this Kutus with his armies in hiding and some are in plain sight. Here the standoff is a Friday. It's the it's 25th, the last Ashara of Ramadan al Karim, And this is where the standoff is going to take place in the year 1260, Common Era. The stage is set for this great battle that's about to take place in Ain Jalut, in this, this, this place which is in Palestine. The forces of evil and the forces of Islam are going to stand off. To find out what happens in this beautiful epic battle, Join us in this next episode as we continue in this 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 tissa, this inspiring tissa of Ain Jalut on the 25th of Ramadan. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.
up high, you spread my